um, MLVAU community of practice, Australian research data commons, all our partners acknowledge the traditional owners of this country. And uh, we um, acknowledge the continuing connection to land, waters, and community. We pay our respects to the people, culture, and the elders of past, present, and emerging. Then I'll kick off. Thanks to everyone for coming to this um, presentation of the outputs of our framework program within the advanced analytics. I'm Adrian Burton from the ARDC, although just checking, I do know a good deal of the people here. Um, I'll go very quickly then across the context because a good deal of you could tell me more about the context than I could tell you, but uh, the ARDC is part of the NCRIS program where this, what you're looking at today is a uh, national research infrastructure program. Uh, the ARDC looks at national scale data initiatives that need um, national scale support uh, that allow our researchers to do research at much greater levels or velocity or efficiency. Um, we have three domain programs in uh, health environment and Hassan Indigenous. This, what you're hearing about today, is part of our health program. So although we're talking about um, federated learning, federated machine learning, uh, we have a bit of a health focus here. The ARDC does have support for um, all types of research. Um, we, within our health program, we identified advanced analytics and AI machine learning as a uh, strategic area for our current five-year program. We started by um, reaching out to uh, a group, the ACDN, that we'd had a, a previous project done, and uh, to the ADSN. So the Australian Cancer Data Network, that's Lois, who's on the screen here. And we also reached out to the Australian Sci Data Science Network um, to help us with a, a plan, if you like. So we're going to do a five-year investment in infrastructure to support AI and healthcare. Then, you know, what was the plan coming from? What did we already know? What was the what was required? So that's what you're seeing today. Uh, it's the outputs of the a, a terrific piece of work that's been done in the area of Federated machine learning, what do we, how do we um, can converge approaches, uh, uh, share, you know, best practice, think about what uh, national level infrastructure might support these federation, federated machine learning initiatives in healthcare research. Um, that's the context. Uh, probably the most important thing is that this was a stepping stone for us. It's the, our first framework project to have that plan. The planning for working with a number of groups actually on federated machine learning and actually uh, converging some of our approaches and actually designing infrastructure that would support a number of research groups working in this area will start very quickly. So this today is the kind of marking the end of our, um, what would you call it? Uh, reaching out and having broad, you know, building consensus, um, getting uh, collaboration around what a future direction should be. And uh, for the rest of November after this, we'll be looking at um, really focusing in on what could we do in this particular area of federated machine learning, as well as other areas of support for um, advanced analytics in healthcare research. So this is, uh, enjoy the, the stuff we've got today. It's a really nice um, point that we've got to, and uh, more importantly, uh, it gives us the structure for a really coordinated and concerted collaborative project at the national level to support federated machine learning. Thanks, Nana, I'll, I'll hand back to you. And uh, at this stage, I, I will invite Louis to um, take charge for the next item. Thank you. You're uh, muted. Thank you. Let's try that again. All right. 
Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Nana. Um, it's really nice to get to this point with the investigations that we've done so far. And I, for one, am certainly keenly looking forward to see what we can do as a as a broader community and exploring how we might be able to support each other and our broader Australian infrastructure. So today we have a review of our Pathfinder project um, and the very brief introduction of a federated learning interest group. And we're really hoping that over time that group grows both as the existing projects expand and as hopefully there's more interest in this as an opportunity. Um, so today I'm going to present an overview of our Pathfinder report and I'll kind of put up front, this is really a fairly top level overview to kind of highlight some of the things that we found, but I would encourage you to actually get on and read that in more detail because I obviously can't cover all of that in the 20 or so minutes that I've got allocated in that space. We want to introduce our federated learning interest group and just kind of the broad goals in that space. And then within our report, we presented on a number of use cases for projects that are currently underway in Australia using federated learning. And so we've asked each of those groups to present briefly on their projects to give everyone a bit of a flavor for their opportunities in this space. Um, so this is our project report. Um, so a very brief introduction to federated learning for those of you that might not be aware, and there's probably not too many online, but basically this is dealing with the challenges of data silos. And this is particularly challenging in healthcare where we have quite tight privacy requirements. Um, we are often dealing with sometimes quite large imaging data sets. And what we would really like to be able to do is to access data in a timely fashion. Um, if we use federated learning, then we can overcome the challenges of having to transport those entire data sets onto a single location. Um, what we can do is use modeling approaches to be able to develop models at each of those local institutions, and then we can combine those model parameters in order to develop an overarching global model. And we can demonstrate mathematically that at least in a number of instances, um, we can achieve the same overall model as if we had developed this in a combined setting. In terms of other top level pieces of information to be aware of with federated learning, um, there are two ways that we talk about dividing our data. So either a horizontal split, and in that scenario, we are dealing with the instance where we might have patient data at different hospitals. So for instance, Mr. Smith's data is completely at Liverpool. Mr. Nguyen's data is completely at Westmead. And so each node contains the full set of data items for each individual patient. The other option is a vertical data split. And in that scenario, we have data items that are recorded in different locations. So for instance, we might have the stage of the disease and the treatment details in one location, but we might have patient outcomes in a different location, for instance, a, a registry data set. And then there is uh, another more useful um, approach when we wanna be able to combine some of those data sets where we can basically divide our data in a combination of those factors. So in this scenario, we have three vertical clients and one horizontal client, but you can split that as you wish. What this enables us to do in a healthcare scenario is to deal with data that might be available at local locations where treatment was received, but also to include um, items from registry data sets. So the goal of our report was to consider the requirements for Australian research groups to work effectively with federated learning, to look at the tools that were currently available and opportunities that we have moving forward, how we might be able to work 
together across the Australian research groups to look at the infrastructure to facilitate that and the environment for operation. And really in particular, to look at what areas we have to streamline use of federated learning and, and make that more feasible for all of us that are working in this space. So one of the first things that we did was a comparison of the open source tools and looked at um, deployment experiences with a number of those tools. So we took some requirements in terms of how we determined those tools. There are actually quite a number of them available um, at the moment. So firstly, from a research perspective, we were interested in tools that were open source so that we had access to the software framework and we had a community of those that were working with the tools. We wanted security features to be acceptable within an Australian healthcare environment. So that was particularly around encryption requirements. And we wanted tools that we could work with. So a flexible framework where we could add in additional features for the particular use case that we were interested in. Um, and then we looked at a number of criteria within that in order to explore the comparison between those tools. So we looked at the authentication, we looked at the process of actually setting up those tools, we looked at programming language support, we looked at debugging tools, um, we looked at documentation, we looked at how much technical expertise and how straightforward it was for people to get started in that framework. And then what we did was we scored a number of those different tools and I won't go into the details of those at the moment, but they are available in the report and each of those have quite a really nice website for you to get on and explore if this is an area that you want to consider um, more clearly. And then we scored each of these according to the criteria that we're interested in. We classified them as either not meeting that criteria, as needing improvement or meeting the criteria. And this just enabled us to do a comparison across the tools that were available that we could potentially consider. What we were hoping was that we would be able to find some open source tools that met the requirements that we were after. And that as an Australian community, we would be able to choose perhaps not one, but at least a limited number of those open source tools that we would be able to work on together that would work for a number of our different projects. And then we could build up a local community of expertise and provide support for each other as we were navigating with these tools. Um, we then explored in greater detail, and if you look at the report, there are more detailed processes for implementing each of these tools for NVIDIA Flare, for Fat Flower, and for Vantage 6, which were a number of the tools that met most of the requirements that we're interested. For each of those, we looked at how easily we could do a quick start for deployment. We looked at real world deployment, and we looked at the features that were available with each of those tools. We focused in particular on understanding the practicalities and the strengths of each of those tools. And this really gave us an opportunity to be able to explore what was feasible with these individual tools and how practical it might be to be able to set these up with, I guess, an end goal that if there was a new research group that was looking to be able to set up federated learning, that there would be relatively minimal overhead for them to be able to take that plunge and to be able to move forward. So I would encourage you to have a look at that in more detail if that's something that you're interested in. We also looked at the data storage and communication. So in particular, the needs and opportunities that we have within this space, looking at the frameworks that we are exploring for deploying those tools. So that included considering um, where we wanted these data nodes to be available on the hospital environments. And so, 
that can create some challenges in terms of the infrastructure that's accessible and the requirements that we have. So looking at data storage requirements, looking at computational requirements, so whether we need CPUs or GPUs, um, and then looking at the communication pathway. So with federated learning, as I'm sure you can understand just from the basic concept, we are passing information back and forth between those different nodes. And depending on how quickly we can share that information um, makes quite a difference to how effectively we can build those models up across the different platforms. And so we've looked at those data storage and the computational requirements that are necessary in that space. One of the challenges that we have highlighted within that is the situation where we are dealing with trusted or secure research environments. And these are environments where basically the system is locked down. We can put data into those systems. We can undertake analysis within those systems. Um, and then we can pull out the aggregate finalized analysis, but we can't take out any of the raw data. That framework is set up to ensure data security, but in most of those settings, what's being used is a manual process for curating that data extraction to make sure that what's coming out is appropriate. That becomes very challenging in a federated learning setting because in a federated learning setting, what we want to be able to do is to run literally hundreds of iterations. So we want parameters to be able to go in and out of those um, data sets. And we need that to happen in a timely fashion. You can imagine that if that's occurring with an individual having to manually review those data items, even if you've got someone that's sitting there and is in a position to be able to do that immediately, that's still a very time consuming and certainly a very resource intensive process. And so one of the challenges that we have highlighted here is if data has to be stored in this sort of environment, then that becomes a challenge for federated learning. There are potentially some other models available in terms of how we could store that data so that we have different approaches for being able to review those that data to ensure that we still meet the requirements as far as keeping that data um, in a secure and, and appropriate fashion. And so this is one of the things that we've highlighted in the report. And I guess this is something that as a broader community, we'd like to be able to work with those that are holding those registry data sets and to be able to come to a solution that that works for all of us, that certainly still meets the requirements of ensuring that that data is secure. Um, and then the next thing that we did as part of our Pathfinder report was to look at a number of different use cases. I'm going to jump over that part of the report at the moment because we're going to come back to those use cases in a minute. Um, but there are a number of them and we will present each of them once I finish, finish this component of the presentation. Then finally within our report, and we did this in a workshop um, across a number of different federated learning platforms to be able to explore some of the challenges and opportunities across those platforms. We've put together a list of recommendations to the AIDC for implementing federated learning um, for Australian research. And I would encourage you to have a look at this list. I think as a community, this is something that we want to be reviewing on a regular basis. We also want to be working together to be able to prioritize that list so that we can support each other and address our biggest challenges as a team rather than as individual projects. And certainly with the support of ARDC, which I think will have a huge impact in terms of what we can all progress forward. So the first of those recommendations, and I guess today's meeting is really one of the first steps in trying to encourage that, is collaboration support. 
And so this is really recommendation for activities to enhance federated learning across Australian research teams and to enable Australian research teams to be able to work effectively together. And you can imagine that each of us is going through the process of developing appropriate documentation, pursuing our separate ethics requirements, having multiple discussions with all of our different IT parties, with the different groups that we're working with. And so one of the things that we are really hoping to come out of the interest group that we're trying, that we're establishing today um, is to be able to work together on a lot of that. And the more input we have in that space, the better. Um, other areas that we have included in those recommendations is support for software tools. So we have reviewed, obviously, a number of those open source tools, but looking at whether there are some of those tools that we can locally develop some particular expertise in so that we can support each other and perhaps encourage involvement in those open source projects so that they become more usable for our particular local environments. Looking at data storage and computational power and thinking around the infrastructure that we particularly need in that space in a healthcare environment. So making some of the national framework available perhaps to meet some of those healthcare standards or working with our healthcare providers as to how we can support that availability for these sorts of projects. Making sure that we are staying on top of security, privacy um, and data equity. So having a good understanding of the data that we're working with and having a good understanding of the security environments that we need to achieve across our federated learning projects. And as I'm sure you can imagine, this is something that's evolving um, across different IT structures as different frameworks develop, then we need to make sure that we are maintaining the standards that are required for this. And if we can do this together, then that means that when we are working with the larger organisations per, for instance, the state healthcare facilities, then we can ensure that we are providing consistent information across the different platforms. That makes life easier for those IT groups. It also makes life easier for us. And it means that we can all come to the point where we have a framework that works for all of us. And then finally, we've included some recommendations around data standardization and governance. And there are some other ARDC projects that are also looking at data standardization, so around ontologies, and just acknowledging that there is a lot of crossover between that data standardization work and what we need within our federated learning setting. So making sure that we are having those collaborative discussions across those groups. So again, I, I would encourage you to have a look at the details on that report and as a community, we have the opportunity to kind of add to those things and, and work together in that space. So out of that, we are suggesting and today really kind of launching our federated learning interest group. The goal of that has come directly out of those recommendations. So really the aim is to have collaborative support recommendations across our different platforms. So we're keen to have involvement from those that are working in that space, but also keen to have involvement from those that are interested in exploring that space because it's good to know for those that want to get into that space what information they need, what support they need to make that feasible. It's open, as I've just said, to anyone with an interest in federated learning. The goal is to work together to address some common challenges and really to learn from each other so that we can um, leverage work that's been done in the different projects so that each of our different areas can benefit. What we're proposing at the moment, although we'd certainly be keen to hear um, from others on that space, is that we aim for quarterly meetings. Two of those we would look at having discussion and prioritisation, hopefully with some actions out of those meetings to be able to work together across the different projects to be able to progress some of those actions that would support all of us. And then the other two meetings would be presentations on 
current programs so that we can get into understanding the detail of the other programs and platforms that are out there and we can explore what we can learn and potentially work together on effectively. So finally, I'm going to jump back to our use cases for federated learning. Um, and firstly, I'm presenting for our Australian Cancer Data Network. I'm going to steam through this a little bit, but feel free to reach out if you'd like some more um, details in the future. So our program has come out of um, a number of different platforms, working with Cancer Alliance Queensland and working with our initial federated learning project. We are looking at cancer data and in the first instance, we're particularly interested in radiotherapy data. We're extracting that data, standardizing our data and then learning from that data. Um, within our data sets, we have tabular data um, and we also have imaging data. And in radiotherapy, imaging data and our radiotherapy treatment data is really detailed, particularly important in terms of how we treat our patients. And it's not available in our registry data sets and it's challenging to get in a combined data set. So this was really kind of the onus of our project. Um, I'm going to skip over our governance. Basically, what we have is a number of different hospitals that are involved and we have data sets set up at each of those hospitals. And as I mentioned earlier, that's in a horizontal framework. We are working towards getting registry data sets set up in a vertical framework. We have demonstrated the feasibility of that work. Um, and just quickly before I hand over to some of the other programs, um, Successes to date, we've had a very large amount of buy-in from clinical partners. And for me personally, as well as others, that's been incredibly encouraging to see our radiation oncologists really enthused about learning more from the data that's available. Um, a couple of publications, um, one led by Matthew Field, looking at non-small cell lung cancer. And this is looking at radiotherapy data sets and exploring whether we can predict two-year overall survival. And we were able to successfully categorize patients into different groups as to whether they were likely to perform well um, intermediately or whether their outcomes were not so good. And then we were looking at the cohort of patients that we had and patients that were treated curatively versus patients that were treated palliatively. And what we were able to highlight in this work was that there was a group of patients that, according to the model, could have benefited from curative treatment, but in practice were receiving palliative treatment. And so this is an area where analysing data in this way has the potential to have impact on our clinical practice. And then the other piece of work that I've highlighted here, and I really highlighted this because we were able to do this in an international setting. So we had a group in Denmark, a group in the UK and a centre in Australia. And that enabled us to access those data sets in a federated learning setting and to develop, an, in this instance, a larynx cancer survival model. But certainly combining international data sets becomes very challenging. And this is where federated learning was particularly useful. So thank you very much. Um, at this point, I think I will hand over to Dong Gang. If you're able to present on your Flora program, and then we'll jump to Ryan and to Dom. Thanks, Lois. Sorry, let me stop sharing my sheet screen. Cool, floor is yours. Thank you. So everyone can see me and hear me? Cool. Yep, all good. Thank you. Um, good to see everyone and thank you, Lois and Nana, for organizing this 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 workshop and um, so I'm just to present uh, our work 
So we uh, that we conducted in the University of Sydney Bremen Center and uh, together with the Sydney Neural Imaging Analysis Center. So we've got um, uh, so this is the flower box that we are going to uh, to show, which trying to empowering our partners with the federated insights. So this flower box we just uh, deploy it using based on the uh, NV FLIR and uh, we have some applied cases with uh, some hospitals across the Australia. And um, uh, and to make this flower box more useful to uh, solve some real world problems, we have got some uh, research outcomes. And um, so first of all, it's um, like a really brief history of this Pro project it's a federated learning ecosystem for research in Australia. So we are Australia focused and uh, we're trying to uh, providing the research and development environment for um, not just uh, clinical applications, but also some uh, real world research and um, some solutions we're trying to uh, trying to see, if, especially in the in recent the AI world, trying to do some uh, like a, uh, like a, a cutting edge AI algorithms and try to make them suitable for the federated learning in healthcare. And uh, in our uh, in this flower box, we are trying to like uh, solve the data management, data archiving, and uh, pre processing, and uh, and uh, and the federated learning and uh, de deployment. So everything happens within the federated system and uh, and uh, we have the, the data, as Lois just said, we the data don't have to go out of the data center. And um, so here are some questions that we are trying to answer uh, when we deal with some real world problems. For example, how the data can be used and uh, uh, how the training will be conducted, when will be the Real good, really good time to stop the training or, uh, or start the training, start retraining, and uh, of course, and uh, uh, what's the uh, what's the best solution for the federated learning machine requirements, and uh, the timeline, and to manage the human resources that's needed for this uh, whole system, and uh, although it sounds like um, big and uh, hard, hard uh, problems, so here we have some uh, some partners and applications in those those uh, those models and together with uh, our partners, including Westmain Hospital, Flinders University, and uh, St. Vincent Hospital, and, uh, and the, the University of Adelaide. And uh, together with AIS, which, which Ryan will introduce it later, and we are trying to push this into the XNet and try to uh, support all people that's using XNet all through Australia. And the models we're doing right now, including the lesion activity. So it's like uh, trying to identify the lesions inside the brain and trying to segment the, the spinal cord and uh, hemorrhage segmentation and trying to do the uh, different sequence classification uh, based on the imaging. So uh, because our most of the tasks are based on the neural imaging. So these are the present, uh, to not present, present uh, successful models and uh, cases. And uh, beyond that, we are also trying to push the uh, uh, previously like the federated learning algorithms into solving some real world issues. For example, the data requirements are different, are hard to answer like uh, as I just said, but we just are trying to say, when will there be uh, enough data collection and when will there be um, a good point to stop training? And also to deal with the data variance, for example, there are some different domain adapted, uh, domain data from different centers and how to how to um, manage them in federated learning and also deal with the noisy data, uh, noisy labels when different centers will have different kinds of uh, uh, data data uh, scheme and data standards, uh, label standards. And also for the recently, we are trying to push our models into some uh, fundamental fu foundation models that will be Kinds of like, uh, so I use a GPT's icon, icon here, but it's uh, like a similar ideas so that we can try to through the federated learning and uh, try to uh, encourage all our partners to come with us and try to build a whole big model that can solve everyone's problems.
And uh, here are some uh, previous work we did for the data. And uh, they, these are some papers, like uh, I, I put them there. And uh, so these are the label issues we are trying to solve uh, based on the noisy label. And when the data, there's only some data without labels, uh, both are also published. And recently we've got a, a paper uh, in submitted in AAAI. And this is uh, kind of like we have, have solved as a really training foundation model issue into the uh, into the real world. But this is like right now we are based on the Chester chest CT, which is um, uh, because the brain, not brain images are really too big to train at this moment. But we are trying to push uh, push that because uh, uh, the brain images will be really important for all kinds of uh, uh, brain related disease. Okay, so um, these are some like really brief introduction about uh, my our work, and it's uh, including the federal uh, based on the flower box and uh, the research outcomes. If you have any interests, and try to feel, feel free feel free to contact me, and this is my email. Thank you. Thanks, Donggang. That was great. Um, I'll hand over to you, Ryan, and. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for questions at the end after presentations. All right, is this sharing? Yes, all good, thanks. Right. Just, just a quick again. Um, so thanks everyone. Um, I'll try to make a bit of time. Um, so Australian Imaging Service is national platform for biomedical imaging. Um, originally established on the two ARDC platforms projects, um, with further investment from national imaging facilities. The idea is to take advanced technologies and make them accessible by non-technical users, wrapping everything securely in a nice browser interface. Um, so functionally, AIS works as both an open source product, so everything is on our um, GitHub organization, and as a federation of partner uh, universities and research institutes who agree to deploy this product um, and operate as a single federation. Um, so every uh, university has a central node that has the core long-term data management analysis capability along with a series of edge devices. So this is um, for either national imaging facility instruments or local deployments inside the hospital setting that act as a, a gateway, both for data transfer, um, and in this case for um, GPU compute, um, connecting to all the nodes. Numbers a bit old, but we have 13 production nodes. Um, and as of last year, supported about 460 uh, academics and, and, and their staff. So the whole goal around AIS is really to support national research programs. Instead of every um, you know, MRFF or NHMRC building the infrastructure from the ground up themselves, can we cover that 80% and then allow them to focus above that? So two of the key ones are the MS Space Imaging Repository. Um, so this is led by SNAC, um, where, where Dong Yang works. Um, and the other one of the other big examples, the ACRF ACEMED, a national program for melanoma detection, um, where a lot of the images are, are nude or semi nude. So they're extremely sensitive. Um, and that's where things where federated learning comes in um, uh, as a key uh, exemplar. So we won't, won't go too into it, um, but AIS works with data centric computing. So instead of having an HPC or GPU cluster over here and you bring your data, we bring all the analysis capability and integrate it into a um, central data management platform called XNet. So AIS has kind of four key services. Um, the first is around data movement and data management. Um, so this is around XNet. The second is non-interactive pipelines. Um, so anything, you know, traditional batch HPC, where you want to run a standard analysis across 10,000 um, research participants in a fully reproducible way. The third is around you know, Jupyter Hub and full uh, interactive virtual desktops that directly mount the data securely. And the last is around machine learning, particularly federated learning. Um, so what we've done 
um, is actually deploy Kubernetes in a hospital environment. So one of the challenges, the technology stack for most research, but you know, particularly machine learning, is very different than the corporate IT stack you find in a hospital. So as a way to bring those together, we've worked with New South Wales Health and some of the other state bodies where they provide virtual machines, which they know how to do. They have service level agreements around. We deploy Kubernetes on top of this, and then we can deploy a number of different applications. Um, and one of those key ones is in vFlare and in the Flare box that Dongyan was talking about, so that we can manage and update the software code inside you know, multiple hospitals and have those linked with point-to-point -point VPN directly with the university-based AIS nodes. Um, won't go too much, but uh, Lois mentioned um, a lot of this data is sensitive. It sits inside TREs. Um, and if you have three different TREs, well, that, that makes it difficult and you start to look at federated analytics. So what we're doing with AIS is because we capture, we control the full acquisition and capture and the movement between all 13 partners, um, is actually running the AIS federation as a federation of, of linked theories where we can lock down different modalities. So some researchers can you know, look at the CT scan. Um, other researchers can only look at the reports. Some can look at you know, the total body photography, the nude images. But being able to segment not just a whole project or cohort, but sub data types within different cohorts to different users and have that data never leave the AIS node. Um, so high level, um, ACRF, ASMED um, will have 17 sites across the eastern seaboard. Um, it's about 450 patients a week coming in for, for screening, my, myself included, um, for those at high risk or medium risk for, for melanoma, um, and then having all their images stored uh, centrally at those universities. Um, so we have an MRFF project, AIO Shields which is building on the original MRFF that established the, the Flara team for multiple sclerosis, and basically transferring that technology to apply, uh, particularly to, to melanoma, but more generally to all um, of those 500-ish research projects that are currently using the Australian Imaging Service to be able to use um, federated learning and other privacy um, preserving techniques, such as uh, natural language processing for de-identifying the data, reading patient reports, um, cybersecurity assurance um, and third-party penetration testing of all the infrastructure. Um, bringing the last slide, which is basically then we have three AIS nodes. So University of Queensland, University of Sydney, and Monash that are leading the ASMED program. But the idea being that we can deploy Flare at Box, integrating it with AIS infrastructure across those 15 to 17 clinical sites so that where patients don't want to send their nude or partial nude images to postdocs, no matter how much you say you'll scrub the name, um, we can increase the amount of Australians who want to participate in this screening program um, without sending their data um, to the universities at all. And that's my high level overview. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Um, definitely an exciting project. Um, Dom, can I get you to present your overview? Thank you. Can I see my screen? Yep. Thank you, Louise, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Dom Gors, Director of uh, QC Data Science, and uh, I am the CI on uh, an MRFF project called NINA, which stands for National Infrastructure for Federated Learning in Digital Health. Now, like all those uh, other projects we've heard of today, uh, this project is about uh, understanding how federated learning can remove that barrier for accessing health data, especially due to uh, privacy concerns, and uh, you know, whether we can enable building machine learning models in multi-institutional healthcare setting. So it's it's uh, real, real world uh, federated learning by deploying infrastructure on existing um, healthcare provider. So we are using that process to understand the uh, maybe new barriers that are being uh, raised um, and the process, uh, the people challenges 
uh, and uh, as as we do that to really uh, deploy infrastructure that will stay and will be available for federated learning. So we have about 23 uh, uh, partners. Uh, the one with uh, their name in uh, black are data providers. And just realized that we also have Cancer Alliance Queensland that Louis just mentioned, which is a registry and uh, can be challenging to, to bring uh, on board. Uh, we have universities, we have hospitals, we have uh, organizations that deal with research translations. We have industry partners. Uh, so it's, it's quite uh, a wide range of stakeholders here. And we have ARDC, of course. Um, oh, I forgot to say that it's led by uh, Professor Claire Sullivan at, uh, at UQ. So the four use cases that we have are, uh, have been chosen to uh, bring different level of complexity, both in terms of data and organizations. So the uh, easiest one is the diabetes use case. Uh, where we are you know, structured clinical data from medical record. And we have two sites. One is a um, uh, patron at University of Melbourne via BioGrid and Queensland Health. So this is uh, horizontal learning, same data at, the, at both sites. Um, but this is already you know, a good use case for us to understand the process of on how to engage with those organizations and address all their concerns. Uh, apply for PIA and all, all those things that are required before we can put some infrastructure into those uh, organizations. Uh, the rheumatoid arthritis one uh, will be combining registry data and medical records. Uh, cancer is going to be some of the most uh, one of the most challenging because now we are talking about unstructured data from uh, pathology report and imaging. And here we are working with Monash, uh, Monash Health and Monash University. And the last one, osteoarthritis, is a, uh, what was described as the vertical uh, federated learning, where we are going to get some uh, robots and treatment data from Striker and uh, medical records from Queensland Health. And uh, uh, <coughs> having all those discussions with those organizations is, is quite uh, interesting. And when you talk to uh, an industry partner like Striker, they've got a lot of questions around the, uh, you know, uh, I guess, cyber security and privacy, but also why are they doing it? So this, this commercial companies are not doing things by just uh, you know, for the sake of doing research. Uh, it's also about and, uh, for them to understand the value they will get uh, by participating in those projects. So, so far we have chosen two uh, uh, frameworks. We have chosen Flower that was described. I, I will describe this as being a simple um, framework. It's robust, scalable, it can be easily deployed. Uh, it can use different type of models. Got uh, enough features to, to, to work, uh, but it's, it's, it is what it is. Now it's quite manual. You need to be on Slack on the phone for the other side to, to, to start the server and connect and so, uh, it, it's not a, like a production kind of framework, but it's a good one to start with. The other one that we are going to use is called PySift, and uh, it's, it's not doing really federated learning, but it's allow someone, uh, a data scientist, to get into someone else's organization <coughs> to build the model. So a lot of the discussions we are having at the start is to understand where do we start? No, we need some data to start at least you know, defining the architecture of the model and, and, and start somewhere. And we can see this, you know, we can use synthetic data sets and we can see this as being quite a, a good framework to have that initial model uh, developed before it is deployed in a federation. Uh, in terms of deployment, now there, there are already so far two use cases, one is Having the uh, a client uh, deployed within the network of the participating site, uh, not many organizations are quite comfortable with this. Uh, uh, but uh, because you no, know, that's that's getting infrastructure in their network. So you no, know, the other option is to use uh, cloud, uh, whether it's commercial cloud or, or, or research cloud. 
So right now we are learning about you know, and having those discussions with um, the IT um, services of those organizations, understanding their concerns. And uh, it's quite interesting because the conversation has really changed from the concerns about privacy to the concerns about who is going to do the work, who is going to pay for it, and who is going to look after the infrastructure. Uh, and so uh, this is the start of this project and, and, and we are really learning about how, where to start. So here you know, I try to capture those different conversations that we have with different people on the different sites. So uh, start with the research questions and we have all the clinicians that are very keen uh, and then they define the research questions. They may identify the data available at these sites. Um, but are we talking about the same data? So now you know, when we have those data elements that goes to uh, having a health informatician that will create some synthetic data set, uh, map that to a map if possible, and uh, everyone that can see the data and, and, and make sure that what the site think is what you know, is identical to what has been uh, uh, created and we can iterate like that. And then we talk with the data scientists that say, okay, that's the data, that's the research question, can I do it? What kind of what kind of model can I run? Is that going to work? And we iterate you now trying to refine maybe the research question and the data and, and until everyone is comfortable with, um, we, 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 we have the research question, we have the data uh, and we'll be able to run a model. The other conversations are now, not only with the research champion at the site, but also with the uh, with the IT infrastructure specialist, and they ask many other questions. Um, and uh, um, we there, there is quite a lot of learning there. So it's quite a large project. Many uh, CIs and partners. Uh, I've tried to capture all of them here, uh, but very happy to. Uh, uh, to be part of this uh, venture and to collaborate with anyone uh, interested in federated learning. Thank you. Great, right. thanks, Dom. That was excellent. Um, we've maybe got time for one or two quick questions. If anyone wants to put anything into the chat or unmute. couple of comments. Um, so Nana has put into the chat around signing up for the um, Federated Learning Interest Group. And I've just reshared my screen, which has got a QR code to join the community of practice for machine learning. And then you can navigate to the Federated Learning Interest Group. Um, in the chat, there is also the the option to fill in spreadsheet details, um, which will give us the ability to contact you moving forward, particularly early in the new year as we get this group off the ground. And I think finally, I might hand back to Nana. Yeah. I think you had so some other things you wanted to talk yeah. about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Is, uh, is Adrian here? Not I will conclude meeting. Firstly, firstly, thank you so much for attending this meeting and getting this community kick-started. Um, we look forward to seeing you in the next meeting and please interact with us through a Zulip, uh, email or whatever that works for you. Telepathy would work. Uh, I'm not sure about my side. Um, but uh, having said that, so we are certainly um, looking to further this and, um, and develop a community. And as um, Louis mentioned, um, ultimately, because there are so many different ways of doing uh, federated learning and some standardization is necessary, but also a lot of harmonization is necessary. Uh, including with uh, data custodians to um, the registries and so on. A number of challenges exist about where to hold the data, how, how could the nodes be set up. And uh, we don't want to be doing it ad hoc every time. So there is a great opportunity to set up a federated learning infrastructure. That is what 
this um, community is about. So welcome aboard and um, come along for this journey. And um, so we will, um, we hope to see you um, soon and um, we hope to hear from you. And um, with that, if there are Nana. no other questions, yeah. Nana, I'm here. I'll just oh, oh, here, here. there you go. Up. Yes. Good. And so everything Nana said, and I just wanted to flag that there are a few formal activities being uh, developed, uh, coordinated through the ARDC on the back of this report around federated machine learning and AI and healthcare generally through our other report. There's a workshop tomorrow, uh, uh, a webinar. Friday, Friday, Friday at, at 3 p.m. At 3 uh, Sydney time. Contact Nana if you'd like to get that broader thing. In general, ARDC will be following up with um, building uh, into our own Nectar uh, networks, the capabilities and GPUs, uh, the, the type of compute support that is required for uh, this kind of research. We want to build um, the tools, build out the tools that are in the recommendations in this report and the other report, make them available in uh, research environments empowered through Nectar as well. Uh, we want to work with this community on the stuff that Nana was talking about, um, uh, interoperability, harmonizing, uh, converging our uh, methodologies for federated machine learning so that it can be supported um, well. Um, and you know, we looked to develop some very broad materials, uh, resources, training, software availability, much more generally uh, for the use of AI and healthcare. So there's a number of programs that will be launched there. We will, if you're interested in this uh, federated machine learning and joining other groups who are doing federated machine learning and trying to align uh, your work, um, then you should contact uh, Nana because we will be uh, initiating programs uh, during the month of November and December. Great. And uh, so I would highlight there is this, this meeting for Friday at 3 p.m. AEDT uh, is, being, is on the chat. So if you haven't um, caught that yet, uh, please come along to the next meeting. So the two studies, uh, you can consider them as twin studies. This, um, this Pathfinder project and federated learning is going into one cardinal issue deep. It's a deep dive. And the framework project, which is a companion or the twin, is, uh, is all about the breadth to understand and co-design uh, uh, for the needs of the community. So please come along for that as well. And at the end of which, we will also give you a glimpse of the um, um, uh, uh, reference architecture and, and the subsequent work that awaits. So with that, I'm um, happy to close the meeting and uh, thank you all again. And uh, I see you on Friday.